Hi, everyone. Uh, Marina Lika, can you hear me, Marina Lika? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, do you know where where is uh, Rima? Yeah, she would be joining. She'll be joining soon? soon? Okay. Yeah. Because the webinar is going to start like soon. We're just going to be waiting for the our moderator to arrive. But I know that Rima is the first person to to give the, the keynote speech. I just wanted to make sure that you, she'll be here. We'll wait a, a bit. Thank you very much. Hello, Rima. It's Brian here. How are you? Do you hear us, Rima? No, let's see. Hello. Good morning. Hello, Rima. It's Brian here. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to have you here. We very much appreciate you joining us. Thank you, indeed. Oh, it's my honor and privilege both. I hope I'm not too late. No, no, we have we have people still waiting in the waiting room. So we have a couple of minutes and the other speakers are with us here. So I'll just say uh, hello to all of our speakers and participants. We're very pleased to have you. We'll just give uh, our audience a couple of minutes to uh, get connected and then we'll start shortly. So thanks, everybody. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I may have to leave by around <coughs> Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I may have to leave by around uh, 615. Hope it's okay. Of course, yeah, and we're delighted that we have Rinalika joining us as well, so we'll be very pleased to hear from her too. Thank you. Thank you. So colleagues, thanks again for joining us. We're just about to start and I would welcome any of you that wish you to turn on your cameras uh, while staying on mute until it's your intervention. But we're looking forward to this discussion. We're very grateful to all of you for joining us uh, and I hope you all enjoy 
the next hour or so in this webinar. So I'm just going to pause for 20 seconds while all of our uh, audience join the connection and then I will commence. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, greetings from the headquarters of the International Energy Agency. My name is Brian Motherway, Head of Energy Efficiency and Inclusive Transitions, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you so many of you joining us from every part of the world. We're delighted to be hosting this event today with a very eminent and knowledgeable set of speakers and on a very, very important topic. So thank you for coming to join us today. In the context of acceleration of a focus on clean energy transitions, we know that in many ways, policy is too slow. We've seen tremendous uh, variations in weather, storm activity, temperature fluctuations in this year of 2023 in every part of the world. Um, and we know that action needs to move faster. At the same time, we see some progress in certain areas. We see acceleration of deployment of some clean energy technologies. And of course, we see a stronger debate on how all of these issues uh, impact on people in terms of the challenges related to climate change and climate risk, in terms of the costs and benefits of moving to new ways of doing things in every sector, new technologies. And of course, we always, working with our governments, try to put a, a central, central focus on people. We call this people-centered clean energy transitions because we understand that all of these policies are ultimately for people and about people in terms of making people's lives better, mitigating the worst impacts of climate change. And in the same time, creating job opportunities, uh, making homes more comfortable, making cities more clean, and making people's lives more affordable, more convenient, and better in every way. Now, clean energy transitions ultimately will create more jobs than are lost in the transition. But of course, we know that this is not always of comfort to people who fear how their livelihoods or their communities or their local economies might be negatively impacted. And we know that not all jobs will be in, in the same places, not all new jobs will suit all types of sector, all types of skill level. And we know that governments are rightly putting a focus on how to protect people who might be impacted in terms of their jobs, their livelihoods, and their communities uh, by changes driven by clean energy transitions. In these discussions around the world, around jobs and workers, we think that maybe not enough attention has been given to uh, the category of informal worker. We know that in some countries, informal workers make a very significant proportion of employment. Uh, and of course, in many cases, informal workers uh, are represented by larger numbers of women, by migrant workers, by uh, um, uh, marginalized communities and are affected particularly badly uh, in certain ways, uh, if not taken care of by th 
through good programs and good policies. And it's highlighting some of those practices and those challenges that we want to do today. So we want to look at questions around what are the particularities of informal workers and communities in relation to the design of clean energy policies and their employment dimensions. We want to look at the particularities related to the representation of women and marginalized communities and, and other groups uh, in those policies, how to make the policies more inclusive and more be beneficial to those who need it most. And we want to look at what governments can do in terms of skilled programs, financial supports, industrial policy, agricultural policy, everything that goes together in the ecosystem of clean energy transitions, supporting workers and communities, and particularly supporting informal workers and economies. Uh, I think we're really fortunate to have some such excellent speakers with us today who are really working on these issues in key regions and countries and have done so for a long time and really understand the subtleties and the nuances of what has happened and what needs to be done. So I'm delighted uh, to thank all of our speakers for joining us. I think we're going to have some really excellent discussions. I'm very, very grateful to all to join us. I'll introduce the speakers as we go along, uh, but first of all, let me introduce our keynote speaker. And I'm particularly delighted to have the honor of introducing Rima Nanavati, who is the General Secretary of the Self-Employed Women's Association uh, based in India. Uh, uh, Rima has been the General Secretary of SEWA since 1999, and the organization under her leadership has grown to be the single largest union of informal sector workers in the world, now representing over 1.7 million workers. So who better to give us an overview of these issues and give, her, give us the benefit of her wisdom and experience than Rima Nanavati. So Sister Rima, thank you very much for joining us, and the floor is now yours. Uh, namaste. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever uh, everybody is joining. Uh, it is my uh, privilege and I thank you, Brother Brian uh, and uh, Matthew Prin as well for inviting me to speak here. Uh, on behalf of uh, SEVA's 2.5 million members, all women workers in the informal economy in India. 93% of the workforce in our country is in the informal economy. Having almost completed five decades since we were established in 1972, uh, uh, organizing the informal sector, poor women workers across 18 states in India, our goals are full employment and self-reliance of our members. Today, the union has turned into a movement and we have spread our wings across the neighboring countries of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Myanmar as well. Our approach is that how do you identify the needs or whatever are the issues of our members? And we try to understand these and design programs and initiatives around the needs or issues or challenges of our members. It is on this same approach that uh, an internal energy audit and budgeting survey was conducted, which showed that the onus of fulfilling the energy needs of a family is largely shouldered by women in the household. Uh, not only that, but women had to spend almost 40% of their time and 25% of their income in accessing the energy needs. And this resulted into their getting trapped into the vicious circle of indebtedness and poverty. And therefore, in order to address this issue of affordable access to energy, SEVA initiated its energy campaign. We call it as Haryali, which means green uh, in, in our local dialect in, in, since 2008. Um, this energy campaign um, in, in 2009 with three goals to deliver energy access, financial inclusion, and women's empowerment. Uh, for our members as well. To ensure the sustainability and feasibility uh, of the Haryali campaign, we have set up a special purpose vehicle called the Grassroots Trading Network for Women, for uh, of which Mrinalika Thapola is the CEO, who will be on the panel as well. 
Uh, we therefore brought access to energy tools and equipments closer to the women workers in the informal economy, uh, both in the urban as well as the rural informal sector workers, be it solar lanterns and then to solar lights, clean cooking to almost 27,000 households today, solar pumps for the salt mine workers, about 7,000 women workers in the salt mines, set up a solar grid, the first ever, which is owned and managed by the women workers in the informal sector. It generates about 2.7 megawatts of energy, which also builds the resilience of these very fragile uh, women workers. The above energy programs not only strengthen the livelihoods of our members, but it also creates uh, alternative and additional employment opportunities for the women in the energy sector. The first was setting up uh, a distribution network for solar lanterns, which then turned to solar lights. The women were compelled to spend at least 30% of their income in availing oil to uh, burn out so that you know they could uh, have some uh, lighting in their homes. As a result, women are able to spend less time uh, on productive work. The education of the um, children was also suffering. And as one of our artisan members says, when you live in darkness, your hearts and minds are filled with darkness. That was the reality of the women workers in the informal sector. Um, and therefore, in order to address this issue of last mile connectivity and high power costs, it also not only addresses the issue of, in the context of lighting, but also has a positive impact on the health of the households. So, so far we have brought about 30,000 solar lanterns. We partnered with the government's electronic skill sector council so that now they have a whole kit. And from lanterns, the women graduated to having solar lights. So it gives them a better status in the society as well. So the kit comprises of solar lights, a fan. And till date, uh, about 30,000 such kits have been um, distributed. The, in order to make it affordable, we have linked them with access to credit so that women could buy it. Let me share a life story of one such rural woman in a conflict remote area of India. This is in Kupwara in Kashmir, where Rubina Akhtar, a 21-year-old worker who had lost her father in the pol political turmoil and had to leave studies to help her mother in the household chores and sustain the family. In her hometown, Kukwara, they rarely have electricity and mostly have to collect firewood for cooking and lighting. When Rubina got a chance to visit Seva in 2014, she saw women assembling solar lights and also repairing solar lights. And she um, immediately enrolled her in the training. This training was a life-changing experience for Rubina. She became strong, confident, and a determined girl. On return to her native village, she formed a collective of women to assemble and sol sell solar lights. It was not easy for a young girl to form an enterprise in a Muslim community. The male members of the village challenged her to repair the light in the village mosque, which was not working for the last two years. Rubina applied her skills that she had acquired and the, repair, the light was repaired in a flash. It was a life-changing incident as the village head priest felicitated Rubina. And today she earns an income of about 12 to 15,000 rupees just by her having her own solar enterprise. I can share thousands of these kind of so, uh, experiences of informal sector women workers setting up their energy enterprises, turning into energy entrepreneurs. Let me also share what Hariali has done uh, in uh, making access to energy, clean energy, more affordable to the salt pan workers who live a life of bonded laborers till they had access to solar pumps. Year after year, these salt pan workers had to migrate to the desert, 
living in inhabitable climatic conditions where temperatures go up to 51 degrees centigrade and living in makeshift tents for almost eight to nine months of the year. 70% of their income was spent on buying diesel oil to run these pumps for 24 hours for almost three months. And therefore, at the end of the sold season, they were left with practically no income to go back home. How do you address this challenge of energy poverty leading to, you know, stark poverty for these women workers? We piloted with five salt, uh, solar pumps as we did not want to play with the lives and livelihoods of these workers. Looking at the success of this pilot, the diesel consumption went down by almost 70%. And it led to increase in productivity and the quality of the salt and therefore the income. Today, we have close to 7,000 women salt pan workers. And we have made this affordable by making it through a public sector bank loan. Uh, let us see a video. I do not want to speak for myself. Let us see a video of a salt pan worker and we can, and that will be the testimony. Can we play the video please? मारु नाम जमना बेन है अने वो मीठा कामदार हो मिट्टू हमारा बाप दादा नो तंतो है ये जमारी आवरज अने ये जमारी रोजगारी हमें रात दी मजूरी कर भी तड़को सायो जोया वगर तारे मिट्टू तमारे ये पोके कड़प के दंत तारों के चंद था नहीं तो लाखड़े पक बढ़ता है हमें बताए ना सुबह तो ख्याल रखी बर्बर पर हमारा कून रखे अच्छा सही है चला आयु पानी डिजिटल मासूम है के चालू करता करता आप ही जाए रात दी तमारा काटे अने पति जाए तो रणनी बार ले वजाओ पड़े इस तो हमारा हारा नसीब ते सेवा याद जाए लो इन्हें हमारी चिंता ही करी अने इन्हें मदद ही करी तो सेवा ना कारण ही है उनका सोलर पंप लिया भी। आम तो कसूर नहीं, चाह पड़ी, पाटा फैला करे। सोलर आया ने, वसी मारे मफत ना एक पाटो पाके। अतर मैं भी आ सोलर नहीं उतार रहा है, मारे ठाम कोई डिजल नहीं। ये मफत ना पाटो पाके ही मैं भी आ सोलर में का है, ए इंटरेस्ट इन पाटो पक्की जाए। हमारी मुड़ी है वादी अन्ना रण मरे वाली निशांति थे जी आज तो कहूँ आड़ जल्दी कोई ना गम तोड़ ने खरे खर हाथ वही तो हमारा सोना ना सुरत सी Thank you so much. And so as you heard from Jamna Ben, a salt pan worker herself, the reduction in the operating costs and increased productivity, she says the sun has turned into a gold mine for us now. And I think as a result now, livelihoods of 7,000 such women salt pan workers has changed and they have become far more stronger. And it has also increased... Uh, uh, and into additional production of salt. And therefore, I think uh, looking at these uh, examples, we did not want that, you know, when the women go back to the villages, they have to keep paying the installments of their loan. So in the, in the lean season, when salt is not produced in the desert, where the desert is flooded and covered with water, we have set up a solar park, the first of its kind, mini grid, which is owned and managed by these women salt pan workers, which is producing 2.7 megawatt of uh, electricity. And that helps the women with an additional income. So this has resulted into uh, energy inclusion, financial inclusion, asset creation, 
and lifting these bonded laborers out of poverty. And this is what the women workers in the informal sector workers at SEVA call just or clean energy transition. Such decentralized production and distribution of energy by setting up the microgrids, which are completely owned and managed by the women workers themselves, making them not just workers or consumers of energy, but producers, users, and managers of energy. And this is uh, uh, what will generate into uh, more and more livelihood opportunities. How do you build resilience of women workers in the informal sector once they have access to clean energy and green energy? And that's where Seva is piloting energy farming. You integrate energy farming with your farming, whether it's horticulture, aquaculture, or agriculture. And the surplus energy that's generated through the solar panels provides with the uh, farmers, you know, a steady source of revenue, which therefore they are able to withstand the climate shocks and the market shocks, which these informal sector women workers uh, face. So having said, these are a few examples. I What I really want to say is that, uh, how to ensure employment transparency in energy investments is a big issue that policy issue that one has to address when it comes to women workers in the informal sector. How many poor women with limited access to energy live on work in locations? As I was talking about Rubina with by fragility, conflict and violence. That's the other aspect that one has to see. What energy and when uh, employment combined opportunities are available to displaced women in the urban and the rural areas? And I think this brings to the next important uh, aspect when green energy inclusion for informal sector women workers happens. It has clearly brought about the nexus between women, work, energy, food, and climate. And that led Seva to launch its uh, Cleaner Skies campaign to initiate a women's role uh, or women's role in climate action in a big way. And in this last one and a half years, we have reached over about 2 million women workers, which has led to some very interesting outcomes like plantation cover, increasing plantation cover, both in the urban and in the rural areas, adoption of clean cooking solutions like biodigesters, uh, bringing in reduction in electricity bills and consumption, cool roof, and how do you switch over to natural and regenerative farming. This has also initiated circular economy of energy spiraling upwards. How can the biodigester bring out slurry, which can be used into their own farms? And that's how you reduce the drudgery of the women and also improve the productivity of their land. And these kind of promoting green practices and adopting green products, how do you convert the villages and the slums into greener slums? And the the other important policy lesson that it brings out is the key to all this is organizing. Organizing informal sector workers, rural young women and men to ensure participation and continuity of the clean energy trans transition. There is a need to adopt systems change approach. Given that transitioning to clean energy solutions is a cross-cutting challenge, there is a need to undertake action research to understand the impact of just energy transitions on the lives and livelihoods. Second, how, how do you also show that energy projects and programs close the gender gap in employment generation and prosperity sharing? Why poor women working are still last to be invited in the energy sector opportunities. Climate change mitigation and adaptation measures, therefore, are meaningless if they do not generate work, build skills, help form assets, and transform the lives of the poor, vulnerable women and workers in the informal sector. 
I would therefore say that a major policy um, a shift that is needed is create a climate resilience fund for women workers, which helps in consolidating and upscaling their adaptation and mitigation measures and find new ways. And this is going to be a blended finance mechanism. This will protect women and their work from risk and accelerate building resilience by generating green jobs and clean assets. And last but not important, and most important, is it will also make women leaders of decarboning economic activities by building an economy of nurturance. So I think the title of this uh, today's webinar, which is on women workers in the informal economy and how do you support these women workers, is twofold. Setting up a global climate resilience fund for women and how do through these funds women take lead in building an economy of nurturance. Thank you so much. Over to you, Brian. Thank you so much, Rima. We're really very grateful to hear those uh, wise words from you and to hear of the fantastic work SIWA is doing with its 2.5 million members and beyond. And I think you really uh, gave us a very powerful address that was very real about what happens in women's lives in particular on the ground and how they're affected by these energy issues, uh, but also looked at all of the dimensions in terms of how energy access, clean cooking, solar energy, employment, income, all of these things are connected and all of the opportunities as well as the challenges are connected. So I think it's really impressive to see the work you have done and what you have achieved. And, and, and it's an opportunity for us to learn from that. And to do so, I do want to now uh, turn to your esteemed colleague, Mrinalika Dapola, who's the Chief Executive Officer of CUS. So, so first of all, Mrinalika, thank you for joining us, but also congratulations to you and Rima for the excellent work you are doing and we have seen some examples of that. And I would like you to, to bring you in as a follow-up to what we've heard from Rima, because we had a focus on the empowering of women's lives and when they take control and the, the work that women themselves can do, that their communities can do, and when they work together. But we also know there are dimensions related to what business decisions are made, what, what companies decide to do, and of course, what policies are put in place. So I wonder if I could ask you, how much do you think um, going in the right direction here is a question of leadership by government and, and the policies they make, or more a focus on women and the communities themselves to take action? Yeah, thank you, Brian, and thank you for hosting me in this panel discussion. Uh, pleasure being a part of this webinar and discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, Reema Ben has very rightly uh, made a point that there is a need to uh, change policies and consider while designing energy transition policies. While uh, designing energy transition policies, policymakers need to really consider several key informal issues alongside formal labor issues that may arise as a result of transition. These issues can have a significant impact on workers in traditional energy sectors and should be addressed to ensure a just and equitable transition. Some of the key informal labor issues that should be considered based on our ground experiences are like limited access to energy services. The informal workforce lacks currently access to modern and reliable energy services and energy transition policies should prioritize expanding this energy access to rural areas, which can improve their quality of life and open up economic opportunities. Secondly, uh, rural energy production. The informal workers in the rural areas contribute uh, significantly in energy production, such as working in small scale bioenergy production and energy transition policies should uh, support and formalize these roles, ensuring fair compensation and safer working conditions. Another uh, impending uh, issues are like uh, unpaid care work. Uh, rural women are typically responsible for unpaid care work, which includes cooking, cleaning and childcare and affordable energy efficient technologies and clean cooking solutions can reduce the time and labor required, uh, required for this task, 
freeing up women time for another uh, economic activities to ensure their livelihood. Energy transition policies, there is, it's important that this energy transition policy should create opportunities for informal sector to participate in the renewable energy sector, whether they're through employment in energy uh, projects or entrepreneurship in areas like solar panel installation or biofuel uh, production. Informal laborers in rural areas who often work in low skilled or unregulated sectors are a significant part of the workforce in the country. So neglecting their training and education could lead to a so, uh, growing socioeconomic divide during the transition to a green economy. It's essential that this policy is focus on skill development, developing their training programs, tailored to the needs of informal workers, focusing on uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and other relevant green sectors. Accessible uh, education is another important factor. We should ensure that these programs are easily accessible to informal laborers, including provisions for uh, flexible schedules and financial support. Awareness campaigns, which Reema Ben mentioned that we have just initiated this effort, conducting uh, awareness campaigns to informal laborers about the benefits of transition to green sectors and the opportunities available through education and training to deal with lack of information and technical knowledge regarding various technology solutions is very, very critical. Access to financing, uh, buying down cost, for new energy technologies intended to meet sustainable development goals, public subsidies are critical for adoption and is the need of an art. Financial incentives to stimulate new re renewable energy development is needed and incentives should encourage lower technological costs through all possible means. And access to financial resources can be a barrier for seeking to start or expand energy related businesses Policy measures should facilitate access to affordable financing and microloans. And the most important is community engagement. Engaging local communities for planning and implementation of energy projects can ensure that policies are responsive to their needs and preferences. Policy options for promoting technological adoption should consider these practical issues and demonstration and pilot projects should be encouraged because we believe uh, seeing is believing. So I feel demonstration and pilot projects should be encouraged. Thank you very much, Vinalika. And you've raised really many really important issues there. But something I heard you stress very strongly is that programs such as skill programs need to be tailored to the needs of informal workers. So I wonder in practical terms, what advice would you give to governments to make sure that that tailoring happens correctly? Uh, here, uh, we have a very practical experience here. What I meant here is like, there has to be a targeted outreach. There is a need to conduct outreach efforts, especially targeting women and marginalized, marginalized groups in uh, to inform them about the opportunities in the clean energy sector and provide access to relevant training and resources. Uh, for example, the project of green skilling under SEVA, where we are imparting training to SEVA sister, aims to empower disadvantaged rural communities, particularly low-income women salt pan workers in underserved areas, such as, but not limited to little run of catch in renewable industry. It has been designed with a vision to create scalable and sustainable employment and entrepreneurial opportunities for the women. Uh, this project seeks to achieve this by augmenting their skills, building their capacities, establishing viable business models and facilitating market linkages to foster self-reliance, sustainable livelihoods, environmental conscious uh, economic opportunities. Uh, this training provides uh, and aims valuable skills in the green energy sector, enabling them to generate income. Additionally, it will empower them to address everyday technical issues related to solar panels, especially within their salt pan uh, farming uh, sites. And the main outcomes of this training are to nurture the young women of salt pan workers 
to become grassroots barefoot solar engineers and train and give self employment to young women who become capable of recognizing and troubleshooting issues that occur more frequently in solar appliances. Thank you very much, Marina Lika. Thank you for raising those issues. Let me turn now to another very important perspective, this time from Indonesia. And we're very fortunate to have with us Eli Rosita Silaban, who is the president of the Confederation of All Indonesian Trade Unions. So Eli, we're delighted you're able to join us. We're very grateful. Uh, and maybe I could ask you to tell us a bit more about recent developments in Indonesia on clean energy transitions and informal economies. And also maybe tell us a bit about your organization, the Confederation Federation of All Indonesian Trade Unions has engaged with this issue. Over to you, Ali. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for giving me a chance to set trade union point of view related to clean energy in Indonesia. And also, I can share a little bit about the issue of informal workers in Indonesia. The energy transition funding commitment through the Just Energy Transition Partnership, 20 billion USD has various challenges. One of them is that public knowledge is minimal because of space for public participation is also limited. However, however, the plan must be carried out because our government already committed about it. I can share uh, an example about the uh, clean energy. We have one area uh, in one island in Java the utilization of the micro hydropower plant in Sumbawa, which was built in 2009. The micro hydropower plant operates 24 hours and can supply electricity for uh, 400, 400 houses. And also uh, five public facilities, 20 foot stall, and seven productive workshops, including coffee processing machine. The factory is managed by a local multi business cooperative and also with the, the, the society in that area. The availability of electricity can improve people's standard of living by providing added value to the product sold. In order to encourage the optimization of the energy transition, the government implements smart system and digitalization, but also pays attention to community contribution. Unfortunately, public awareness still very far from the expectation. Some, some of them say that the, the impact will not come uh, suddenly, still like 50 or 100,000 more, so they, they read it. But some of them also already increased their awareness about the impact of the just uh, energy. In order to, uh, uh, now the government also encourage community, community participation in the development of renewable energy by regulating Ministry of Energy and Mineral regarding the installation, establishing minimum energy performance standard regulation, developing small scale renewable energy, providing incentive and grants, holding seminar, training and workshop to disseminate of the information. post call economic transformation planning needs to prioritize economic activities that provide multiplier effect in the local communities. I think the problem also uh, stay the same with the, uh, the previous speaker. We see that impact of a, uh, of a potential decline in coal production in the informal economic sector, which has not been recorded in microeconomic analysis. I don't know, maybe in global already there, but uh, in our understanding and we didn't, and we never uh, get it and we didn't know yet about the microeconomic analysis about this issue. The coal mining industry has a significant social and environmental impact on the surrounding communities. For example, degradation of air and water quality, changes in communities' livelihood resources, economic inequality, and increasing consumerism and rent seeking. Different interests, knowledge, and access to information make each party have a different perspective in addressing the energy transition. For example, coal companies are more aware of the risk of the energy transition to their business than the government and uh, uh, citizen. But now, companies and local government are starting to carry out various economic transformation initiatives. However, local community actually more skeptical about the potential decline in coal because lately they have seen an increase in production of the coal. 
However, changes in perspective are also taking place in society and coal industry companies. The community began to have a vision for economic diversification and coal companies began to develop business in other fields. It is important that government and various stakeholders can encourage wider awareness and initiative structural changes towards economic to, uh, transformation effort. We know that some factors that hinder to adoption of clean energy, such as problem of land ownership, lack of local experience, and unattractive tariff, unattractive tariffs. We found from various discussion that how to realize sustainable development requires some at some point like comprehensive economic diversification and transformation planning and by involving stakeholders and community participation. Expand access to education and training to prepare a competitive workforce in sustainable sector and increase financial literacy for the community and increase the participation of all elements of society, especially those vulnerable groups. We also see the interest of women in work related to energy transition is quite low. There is a gender bias that needs to be observed as if the energy transition is a male technical work. That is the uh, introduced to the to the to the people and the and uh, to the citizens. The importance to involve of women in the decision making in the energy sector can oversee the perspective and interest of women to be accommodate, accommodated to produce inclusive and sustainable quality. And now I'm uh, going to uh, how our organization to engage about the issue. Since few years ago, we already organized informal workers to join the union and we uh, train them and introduce them to have access to social security and explain the impact of just energy transition to their life and, the, and uh, their future. KSBC held discussion with the employer association to immediately establish the national committee for just transition and uh, transition energy and soon we will deliver it with government. We're seeking contribution from other stakeholders, partner organization, ILO, ITC, to organize seminar, conference, and do socialization because uh, trade union has no budget to do uh, by our, ourselves. We organize collective bargaining agreement training for two regions right now in, in Indonesia because only two regions affected mentioned right now, even though we understand more than that. Establish a cross trade union confederation forum for just energy transition to make some uh, perspective about the issue, social dialogue with government at national level and the region, capacity building to increase awareness and ready, ready to accept changes and ready to seek skill development. Active in every activities carried out by the government or other stakeholders and we provide our input. For example, the total of our member or workers affected in the region and also how the future of the community. Urge the government to involve trade union in the designing roadmap and inform trans transparency of their scenario so we can introduce it the, during our discussion and meeting with the workers and also the uh, society. That is uh, only I can say right now, but I'm still here if you have any questions. Ellie, thank you very much indeed. It's great to hear of all the work you are doing in Indonesia, but also to hear your, your, your judgment of the issues there. And I do think there's quite a few similarities in the kind of debates and, and challenges, as well as opportunities that, that you have raised that we, we heard from our previous speakers. So it's a great pleasure to hear from you and thank you very much for that. And I'm going to return now to another Indian perspective, another very important one, because we're going to hear from Sri Harika, who's an eminent PhD scholar in the School of Public Policy in IIT Delhi. And Sri, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to have you here. And having heard uh, Ellie from Indonesia, but also Rima and Marina Lika from India, and we've heard quite a lot of emphasis on the 
positive benefits of clean energy transitions if they're done right, if their policies are designed well. And we've heard about people benefiting from clean energy. But of course, we know as well that there are many informal workers and especially women working in the coal sector in, in India, for, for example, right now. And there must be many concerns about the future of their livelihoods and those of their families and communities. So, so I know this is something you look at very closely. So based on your research focusing on coal communities, could you tell us please a little bit about about what your views are on some of the key issues that are specific to informal workers and economies uh, in the context of India, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Brian, for your kind introduction and uh, the question. Um, so as we have heard from our colleagues at SEVA that majority of Indian workforce is uh, employed in the informal sector, and so is the case with the energy sector as well. For instance, in the coal sector, we have more than 75% of the workforce, uh, which is uh, informally employed. Though there is no official uh, estimation of the numbers, but this is like an approximate number that we have arrived through conversations with the workers and also spending some time in the coal regions. And adding to this, we see that there is a very strong gender dimension to this informality, uh, especially in the mining and quarrying sector, uh, where we do have some official data available. We see that 50% uh, uh, of male workforce uh, is employed in the informal, uh, is employed either informally or through self-employment. But we see that more than 80% of female workforce is uh, employed informally. So there definitely is, uh, we see more female uh, workforce in the informal sector, especially in the mining and quarrying sector, which are important for the um, en energy transition. And again, as our uh, colleagues from SEVA have highlighted, that uh, informal workers in coal regions as well work in under very precarious conditions um, without proper job security. They do not possess uh, social security benefits as well. And their wages uh, in most of the cases are lower than those of the formal uh, workers. And in addition to this, um, occupational health hazards uh, are very prevalent in this sector. And these include um, chronic lung diseases, such as silicosis, asbestosis, and also um, uh, hearing loss is one of a major illness, which lowers their working age and forces them to retire early. But however, if we compare uh, informal workers in coal sector to other um, to other sectors such as garment, big garment industry or uh, building and construction sector, we see that the coal workers are paid more than um, the other sectors. And this also suggests that there are economic factors that are driving some workers to choose uh, employment in the coal sector despite uh, its inherent risks and um, uh, informality. So then these numbers then set the context of why do we need to consider the informal workforce when planning for an energy transition. And uh, it is seen that um, in the coal sector, informal workers are employed at all levels, from coal mining to coal washeries to coal uh, transportation. And along with this, there's also a very huge uh, economy around coal, which caters to the, this industry, and it is mostly informal. This can be in the form of uh, milk trading, tailoring, carpentry, uh, grocery vending, small businesses, operation of modest hotels, eateries, uh, and all which basically are around the uh, coal industry. Um, so it is not just energy transition that we're looking at, but it is more of an economy transition um, that, that we should be focusing on. And uh, also we have seen in the past that um, with any transition or closure of a particular industry, uh, it has detrimental impacts, especially on the informal workers. Uh, for example, in the recent past, we have had some closure of coal mines. Um, mainly due to underproductivity and um, uh, extinction of the resources. But we have seen that in, in such cases, the formal workers have been uh, rehabilitated. They have been given jobs in some other uh, industrial units. But, uh, but the informal workers were again left to themselves with uh, no other uh, job opportunities. And with this, also the informal economy around uh, these areas also um, uh, I mean, it, it also gets affected uh, because we have seen in some of the case studies that we have done in mining regions that close to 45% of household income is spent on the local economy of that region. So after the closure, if there's a closure, then this spending becomes zero uh, and the informal economy then just drops. Uh, and um, there's also a very uh, large loan burden on uh, the uh, the people who run these small businesses uh, and uh, small enterprises around these uh, coal regions. 
And uh, for example, we have seen this not just with the closure of coal mines, but very majorly we have seen this with uh, a sudden ban on iron or iron or mining in some states in India, uh, where uh, the truck owners uh, who have whose whose primary uh, source of income was transporting the ore. Um, so when there was a ban on this mining, uh, they did not have any income from transportation, and then they also had loan burden. Uh, which they had taken to um, uh, buy the trucks. And now the, the situation is still ongoing with uh, no proper rehabilitation for these informal workers. And with the closure, we also see that the public goods infrastructure that is created by the companies, be it the schools, be it the healthcare centers, be it uh, vocational training centers, all of these also get closed. And again, in this also, the informal workers are the ones to suffer the, the most. Another major issue with uh, closure or with uh, shutting down of a certain industry unit is migration. We see that uh, because of lack of opportunity in the region, uh, the workers tend to migrate. And also because there is um, there is desperation to find a job, uh, they settle for less wages and they settle to also work in hazardous uh, or harsh working conditions. And um, Especially in the coal regions, what we see is that uh, because there is no proper mine closure planning that is happening in India so far, um, there's a lot of illegality around it. So we see uh, the local communities gathering and selling coal um, uh, in, the, in the local markets. This is also, this is a source of livelihood, uh, but, it, but the way this gathering of coal is happening uh, is also very dangerous and it's life-threatening. And it also has environmental implications and if it, if it is not done with proper uh, safety standards. So then considering some of these um, issues around informality and coal transition, uh, I think it is important that we identify some key stakeholders who play like a very important role in advocating for the rights of these informal workers. And these to me are civil society organizations, the trade unions and the local governments, which are the Panchayati Raj institutions in India. Um, so I'll begin with local governments. Um, uh, sorry, I'll begin with the civil society organizations. I think civil society organizations are the most underutilized stakeholders in this discourse on um, energy transition so far. Um, so CSOs operate in various activities ranging from education, healthcare, livelihood promotion, uh, human rights, etc. And majority of them cater to problems of informal workers and the economy. So they have expertise. So they also have expertise in working in very niche areas. Uh, for example, uh, uh, an organization called Samata, it works on children in mining areas. So they do not just look at uh, child labor, but they also look at what happens to children in these areas in general, uh, in terms of their education, their health and all. But however, children as a, spe as a, spe as a different category has not uh, gotten any importance at the national level discussion so far. So their proximity to uh, local communities, their understanding of the local context, and the understanding of the political dynamics actually makes them very important stakeholders. Uh, and it is also important to note that informal workers is not a homogeneous category. So they come from various socioeconomic cultural backgrounds, and um, some of these CSOs are able to cater to those needs as well, the needs of those groups as well. But so far uh, in the energy transition discourse, these organizations have only been used as a source to gather data. And we do not see actual partnerships or meaningful collaborations with these organizations at the national level. So I believe that along with government support to the CSOs, it is also important that we as civil society engage with these organizations with their capabilities and their, with their expertise, um, which, they have been, which they have developed working for many years in these areas. Um, then having said that, it is also important that we converge the isolated activities of these uh, CSOs in order to address some of the pressing issues. Uh, we need to like uh, maybe provide platforms where these organizations can come together and develop plans that are more holistic. Here, I also believe that uh, donors and uh, funding agencies also can play a very important role in curating these partnerships between the national and local organizations. So the funding should not just ensure that money uh, comes not just for top-down um, knowledge generation and top-down capacity building of local organizations, but creating those knowledge partnerships where both benefit from each other. And um, along with this, I think another least consulted stakeholder, I would say, is the trade unions in Indian case. So especially post the uh, uh, discussion, post the Paris Agreement, we see that uh, there, there has been a revival of trade unionism in India. 
uh, in my area of study, which is the Singareni coal region in India, we see that there is a rise of something called as the social movement unionism, where trade unions are, uh, I mean, trade unions are not just advocating for the rights of workers, but they're also advocating for the rights of coal dependent communities. Um, and in the past couple of years, we have seen some of the major trade unions bring in their ambit informal and contractual workers and are advocating for their wages and their rights as well. So, um, and if you're talking about renewable energy sector, uh, in most parts of the, in most parts, parts of India, renewable energy workers are also not unionized. So it is like a two-sided opportunity for coal trade unions to actually unionize the renewable energy workers as well, and to also advocate for their uh, rights. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, I think what is happening in Singareni and uh, the way they are, the, the way trade unions are playing a, a role in advocating for, uh, especially the rights of informal workers, I think we can use that as an example for other coal uh, regions as well. And um, and in in general, if we see that human development indicators in most of the coal regions are uh, worst performing, uh, this can be due to lack of um, the, uh, resources. I mean. Uh, there's, there's an argument about the resource curse of, or lack of uh, infrastructure development or other issues, and we can theorize about it. But I think what is important is we need to understand what people want uh, on ground. And uh, in this, local governments can play a very important role because they are the, they, clo the, they interact very closely with the local populations and, uh, and they can help us in uh, the needs assessment and understanding the, and planning some of these programs. So I think in order to gain confidence of local communities, spread awareness of the just transition planning, uh, CSOs, trade unions, and local, the, the capacity of these organizations should be leveraged. Uh, and they can form the bridge between the international national commitments and what, what is happening at the ground level. Thank you. Three, thank you. Now that's very, very clear. And I, I, you've raised a number of really interesting dimensions and given us some insights as to the real issues here, as our other speakers have done. And I was struck by your use of the phrase, the transition of the economy as well. And, and because you talked about national issues and more regional issues, and I know you focus on that. So could I ask you just for a brief word on how much do you think, looking at looking at the states across India, the nature of the of coal in the economy is very, very different in different states. So how much, are these issues the same in different parts of India and different regions and states, and, and therefore, are, are they different? And therefore, how much when we talk about policy, are we talking about national policy or more local level policy being the most important? Yes, thank you, Brian. I think um, very broadly, the issues it all in the different states that we're talking about are more or less same, but it, but it, but when it comes to the other human development um, indicators, we see that some states are performing better than others, and that is the reason why in those states we also see uh, the coal sector or the coal workers performing better in terms of income and in terms of job security. So I think it is, I think as as you also said that it is, it's more about having that holistic planning. Where we're not just looking at coal uh, workers as a uh, part of a certain sector, but we we uh, try to uh, bring them within the larger uh, developmental uh, planning and larger sustainable development planning. Uh, and uh, we, sh I mean, it's it's definitely important that we look at local context, have more state level policies, have more state level planning. I would even, I mean, if if we have the capacity, then we should actually do these plannings at the local level. We should include the local uh, governments uh, and their uh, expertise in this. But if, if, if even if we don't go to that level, I think it's very important that we have state level policies and not just a top down uh, national policies on these things. Because I think these are also geographically very different. They have different uh, land, they have different soil. So even in terms of rehabilitation of the, uh, of the mining sites, it's important that we consider these local factors. Thank you very much, Sri. That's really very interesting. Thank you. And several of our speakers have raised, all of our speakers, but I think have raised dimensions around finance and capacity building. And I'm going to go now to Elise Hatting for a particular 
perspective around that. Elise is a sustainable growth researcher at TIPS, the Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies in South Africa. We all know that South Africa is a key player in some of these discussions, uh, though the nature of informal workers is very different there. But, but Elise has been really active in this agenda for a long time, particularly around the nature of financing, capacity building, entrepreneurship. So Elise, thank you very much for joining us. And maybe you could share your perspective from the perspective of the South Africa dimensions, but also how you see it's best to support marginalized and informal communities. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think from South Africa, we have a very unique perspective uh, in, in our social, economic, and political context. Um, I think the whole world is starting to see South Africa from a just energy transition is becoming quite a, a bit of a buzz. If I can say it like that. So a lot of lots of activities on the ground. Um, but from today, what I'd like to kind of highlight is um, how we've been dealing with our energy shortages and, and, and energy security challenges, but also being very mindful to leave no one behind. And there's a very big focus on youth inclusion and female inclusion with involving these new economies and green industries. And um, this obviously also have a big focus on the informal sector and, and reskilling of, of workers and addressing a lot of the anxieties that there is, especially with phasing out of coal mines. So what we've seen from a policy perspective um, over the last two to three years, uh, our organization has worked quite closely on looking at access to inclusive finance. And this is very much for the MSME on the ground uh, in rural and marginalized communities who is looking at climate mitigation and climate adaptation more specifically a solution. A lot of this is not necessarily because um, the marginalized groups want to be entrepreneurs, but there is an absolute failure in our economy to absorb anybody uh, from a worker seekers perspective. So one of the programs was um, Youth Bridge Trust. It's about a 300 unemployment youth uh, under the presidential stimulus program, which was quite successful, but it was exposing um, graduate youth. So these were engineers and highly skilled and graduate youth whose families have offered a lot to get them to university and the economy is failing to absorb them. So they've been sitting at home two to three years without absolute any income or even an ability to get work experience. So what we've done, we've exposed them to green industries and especially in South Africa, water shortages, also the quality of water, drinking water and access to water in rural communities. Uh, pollution, obviously, from, from water bodies uh, due to mining activities, but also really looking at Mpumulanga, where a lot of our coal mines are situated, looking at new industries that can absorb these skills. But uh, these, these unemployed youth, especially in a lot of women as well in that uh, area, um, just don't have any economic means. They've got um, qualifications and skills to contribute to the economy, but it was to create awareness levels for them of where new industries and services are needed and what kind of programs are there to support them so they have to become entrepreneurial and they are very likely then also to create two or three informal jobs in the economy by setting up their businesses but what we've seen is climate finance not really reaching the level of a micro enterprise size of accessing finance um, I think it's really much the climate finance in South Africa is still in the very large renewable energy um, projects. And for even a woman with very little financial background or in most uh, entrepreneurs being in highly indebted, uh, to access finance and the eligibility criteria, it, it's, it's not viable. So what we're looking at at the moment is also um, greening microfinance and looking at different types of financing models to bring the climate finance much closer to the ground, smaller amounts that could really also respond to climate mitigation. And we see this as quite something quite beautiful in terms of how the just energy transition is also unfolding to be more inclusive in many areas, many sectors of, of green industries. Uh, but we still do not have a dedicated climate finance MSME policy. We see that some a critical um, attention is needed within the next two years to develop such a policy and also attracting the climate finance to these groups. 
Um, so yeah, very good uh, research and projects is, is start taking place, but that's how we are shaping our agenda to also look at the informal workers that would benefit from, from, from entrepreneurs getting access to inclusive finance. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. It's great to hear the work you're doing and you've emphasized the inclusivity dimension. So could you say maybe just a little more about how do you make finance inclusive? How do you make these programs inclusive? And if I don't mind, I'll tack on a second question because your focus is on the green economy and decarbonization or related matters. And do you think, when you think about finance for at a micro level with a focus on inclusivity, if you're focusing on clean energy, decarbonization, sustainability, is it different than if you're doing it in other sectors or for other reasons? There's kind of two questions there, one about the inclusivity side and one about the what makes focusing on the clean and, and decarbonization special. Great. So, um, yeah, I think in terms of the inclusion, a lot of the, the enterprise development and youth development and female entrepreneurship development programs are very much inclusive due to the nature of the beneficiaries that they are actually onboarding in these programs. And um, in South Africa, we, we regard youth as the ages between 18 and 35. So um, that's, that's one aspect. And then the businesses and programs and even the youth development funding is linked towards, we call it eco-inclusive um, kind of programs. And, and they are specifically also situated within Mpumalanga, which is a coal mining region to start letting youth um, be incorporated within the new green industries. That's the one aspect. So I think uh, that's just from a beneficiary um, selection criteria. And number two would be um, in terms of the sectors, I think we are all aware of 2050 decarbonization commitments globally and our, um, our commitments as South Africa, but it is important that we're looking at a number of industries. So in South Africa, we look basically at eight green industries and we've identified opportunities for MSMEs. So this is water, transportation, energy, climate smart agriculture, waste. Um, there's a couple of the obvious ones. But I think the big focus is also between the clean and renewable energy and energy efficiency, how that is embedded within the sectors. So if you're going to start climate fine, uh, climate smart agriculture business, how do you look at your water, uh, the, the way you pump your water, the energy mechanisms that you use so that they are very much connected. It's not that we're isolating them, but I think it's very important in the discussion is when we're looking at the ability of um, small enterprises and micro enterprises absorbing um, informal sectors into their businesses, we are looking at um, small pockets of funding. So if you are in agriculture or you're even in water provision, the type of finance that you need is very different than when you are setting up a micro grid for solar PV. You know, so we need to be very conscious around a sectoral approach and also the types of skills from informals that can be absorbed into these smaller enterprises. But it's very important that you know, when you're looking at the energy and just energy transition and you want to invest money into, for example, female youth owned businesses who are setting up uh, renewable energy projects, it's a very, very different story than looking at more mitigation level regarding uh, water, water pumps or just water filtering and providing communities with water. So I hope that helps. <laughs> it helps a lot. Thank you very much, Elise. And colleagues, time is upon us. We've heard really excellent perspectives. I'm sorry we don't have another hour. I certainly learned an awful lot from listening to all of you, and I know everybody joining us today have. It's been really enriching. We've heard different countries and different angles, but I think we've heard a lot of commonality too around the importance of focusing on these issues and some really excellent work going on uh, across the world uh, on supporting informal workers, women in particular, marginalized communities. So I think it's been very uplifting to listen to you all today but also really educational to understand uh, the issues and, and how and to understand what governments can do, what communities can do, what civil or society organizations can do, and also, of course, what unions and other key actors can do. So I want to thank you all very much, Elise, Sri, Ellie, uh, Marina Lika, and of course, Rima. We really enjoyed your perspective and thank you very much for joining us. And everybody who's joined us today, thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending this time. And just to remind you that this webinar 
are is part of the IEA's growing work program on people-centered and clean energy transitions. So we'd love to hear from all of you. Please get in touch if you have experience or ideas to share. All of our speakers, I hope we can continue to learn from you and continue to stay in touch as we work on these issues in the future. So we'll draw this to a close for today, but thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.